But once the primaries were over, it was either the Democratic platform and everything I just mentioned or Donald Trump. Donald Trump had once been pro-abortion, but he changed and became pro-life. He has spoken strongly of religious liberty. The Republican platform on which Donald Trump was nominated was unlike the Democratic one. It was one of the strongest platforms ever on biblical values from life, marriage, religious freedom, and even Israel and Jerusalem. The stakes were perhaps the highest they have ever been. It's always said that at this, at this election, but this one, because it would have sealed. But as for Donald Trump, everything you are not supposed to do when you're running for president, he did. And he did more than that. He did everything in the book, and then he went with things that were not in the book. As for the two parties, since the election at the end of Ronald Reagan's term, there have been six elections. Out of the six, how many have Republicans won the popular vote of America? One. One out of six. The Democrats had won the popular vote five out of six. There are demographic changes as well. Trump may have been, at least on record, the most unpopular candidate in history. Christians were torn in that his past life in no way seemed Christian. Much of his behavior did not seem or was Christian. But he did commit to most of the key issues. And the alternative was to seal the end. Even the Republican establishment was reluctant to back him or to spend much on his campaign. Between the spending of the two candidates, there was not even close of how much was spent on the Democratic side for Hillary Clinton and how much for Donald Trump. It appeared hopeless. Poll after poll after poll, every major poll showed a decisive victory for the Democrats, if not a landslide. And the Electoral College was even worse. The swing states were lost. Talk of, there was talk of Republican damage for destruction for years to come. The only question was how much damage the Democrats were preparing for victory. Republicans were preparing for defeat. Media was preparing for the victory of the Democrats. Obama was confident that his legacy was assured. And believers were resigned, men, most believers, as were most people, to a, this, end, this end scenario where they would be marginalized, vilified, almost learn how to exist as a persecuted people. Paying for the killing of the unborn, watching their children being indoctrinated against God. I was in Jerusalem when the election took place, and I was expecting to wake up to some news. I woke up, looked at my cell phone, and saw things like Trump surging ahead. And in the morning, in Jerusalem, it said on my cell phone, Trump wins the presidency. <laughs> the Democrats were in shock. Obama was in shock. Hillary Clinton was in shock. The Republicans were in shock. Hollywood was in shock. Wall Street was in shock. Most Christians were in shock. The nation was in shock. Israel was elated. As were believers. In the Bible, God often shows himself by moving against the odds. Gideon's 300 against thousands of Midianites. Little David against the giant Goliath. Twelve disciples of a Jewish rabbi against the might of the Roman Empire. So this election was so totally against the odds that you actually saw experts apologizing on television for how wrong they were. There was an entire fireworks display. They said this was millions of dollars ready to go off by the Democratic Party. That's how confident they were to celebrate Hillary Clinton's victory. They never were launched. Mr. President, I want to raise an issue that I think has been lurking out there for two or three weeks and cast it specifically in national security terms. You already are the oldest president in history, and some of your staff say you were tired after your most recent encounter with Mr. Mr. Uh, Mondale. Um, I recall yet that President Kennedy had to go for days on end with very little sleep during the Cuba Missile Crisis. Is there any doubt in your mind that you would be able to function in such circumstances? Not at all, Mr. Truitt, and I, and I want you to know that also I will not make age an issue of this campaign. I am not going to exploit for political purposes, my opponent's youth and inexperience. <laughs> if I still have time, I might add, Mr. Truett, I might add 
that um, it was Seneca or it was Cicero, I don't know which, that said, if it was not for the elders correcting the mistakes of the young, there would be no state. The sponsor has been identified, but unlike most television programs, the performer hasn't been provided with a script. As a matter of fact, I have been permitted to choose my own words and discuss my own ideas regarding the choice that we face in the next few weeks. I have spent most of my life as a Democrat. I recently have seen fit to follow another course. I believe that the issues confronting us cross party lines. Now, one side in this campaign has been telling us that the issues of this election are the maintenance of peace and prosperity. The line has been used. We've never had it so good. But I have an uncomfortable feeling that this prosperity isn't something on which we can base our hopes for the future. No nation in history has ever survived a tax burden that reached a third of its national income. Today, 37 cents out of every dollar earned in this country is the tax collector's share. Now for the dangers. One of the problems some believers fell into in supporting Donald Trump early on and throughout was at times to rationalize what was not of God, even sin or carnality, or to advocate for policies which are not necessarily biblical as if they were. There, there are, though there are issues that are issues. And those, the issue of his life and behavior, that, that does have a place. But most important will be his stands and his actions concerning America and the world. Those issues are still issues. And they should no, no more be defended or justified in a Donald Trump than in a Bill Clinton. We have to be, we cannot compromise in any direction. The Harbinger reveals the parallel, as I said, between the last days of Israel and, the, and these days of America. And the key scripture is Isaiah, as you may know, as most of you know, Isaiah 9:10, where the people, after, in, after having a warning sign from God in the form of an attack by really the first terrorists of the world, the Assyrians, they respond not with repentance, but defiance. And it centers on that vow that they make, that basically they say in Isaiah 9:10. We're coming back stronger. We're not going to repent. We're not going to, we're going to do it on our own. We're not going to be humbled. The Harbinger came out in 2012, first came out. I wrote it in 2010. 2010, years before this election. And what people, most people don't realize is that in the pages of the Harbinger, I included Donald Trump. You can find it in the chapter entitled, The Tower. And here's a quote from it. The fourth Harbinger is not simply about rebuilding, but what was destroyed but it must specifically involve rebuilding bigger, taller, stronger, and better than before. That distinction is clear in the scripture and in the commentaries. And now from a commentary on Isaiah 9:10, Since their houses had been destroyed, they would build bigger, better, and finer ones. So too it came out in the words of those attempting to rebuild Ground Zero. One of the nation's most prominent real estate magnates said this of the proposed project. We should have the World Trade Center bigger and better from the commentators on ancient Israel, if they ruin our houses, we will repair them, speaking about ancient Israel, and make them stronger and finer than they were before. From the American magnate on the rebuilding of Ground Zero, what I want to see built is the World Trade Center stronger, maybe a story taller. Donald Trump was one of those words echoing Isaiah 9:10, the vow that brought judgment. And it was in the chapter of the tower. Donald Trump, more than any man alive publicly, is linked to towers. And he was also linked in his life to pride and arrogance. And his campaign was, make America great again. Yes, but the only way America can be great again is for America to return to the God who made America great in the first place. <laughs> to vow to become great again without God, without a return to God, is Isaiah 9:10. It's the harbinger. To become great by our own powers without God. Now, he started out that campaign saying he didn't see any need for asking God for forgiveness. That is anti-biblical. At the same time, there has been a change, which I will get into. Another caution. One of his senior counsels is an activist for the gay agenda. And there are other issues. Nationalism and patriotism, for all fine America first, can also become an idol. The answer is not business. The answer is not economics. The answer is not America first. The answer is not self-interest or having no compassion on the stranger. The answer is only God. Only. But now on the other side, an interesting phenomenon has also taken place. More than any other group of people, people group or interest, it has been 
born again evangelical believers who have influenced Donald Trump in this election. And who influenced this election. They were decisive this year. It appears that God has surrounded him with believers from Franklin Graham, James Robeson, Robert Jeffries, many others, and of course, Mike Pence, who is a strong and solid born again believer, who said, quote, I am a Christian first, then a conservative, and then a Republican. And Mike Pence undoubtedly will be there to influence Donald Trump. Already he was put in charge of the transition. Then there are the cabinet appointments. It has been said there are more known born-again believers in this cabinet than of any other president. One of the men... Now, I'm not, saying, I'm not saying this was Donald Trump's plan, but I am saying that all this, God has his own plan. One of the main concerns of believers in recent times has been the indoctrination of children away from God. It's gotten a worse brazen, brazen, brazen. Where children as young as first graders, kindergartners, are being taught that sin is good and God's ways are wrong and you are not actually a male or a female, but you have to figure out who you, what you are. But Trump appointed a born-again believer who is a firm believer in home schools and, and choice for parents and who is reportedly given fortunes and donations to organizations like Focus on the Family as Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos. As America's ambassador for Israel, Trump picked David Friedman, a Jewish man who totally upholds the right of Israel to Israel and Jerusalem, and of whom it said he's more strong and conservative than Benjamin Netanyahu. <laughs> On the day that America under Obama abandoned Israel to the condemnation of the United Nations, which declared that Jerusalem didn't belong to Israel, Donald Trump answered it by telling Israel, hang on, Israel. Wait for November 20th. Trump has promised to move the American embassy for the first time from Tel Aviv to Israel's capital, Jerusalem. Now, there's much to say about that. That's in the other message, whether it's next week or after. But I will just say that the whole world is threatening that you do not do that. European unions, you can't do that. You know, the, the Palestinian Authority says you're going to have, we're going to, you're going to have it up. We're going to go, you can go crazy. You do that, all this stuff. Pray he has courage. Trump has also promised to defend believers' religious freedom, to seek to defend life, cut the funding for the killing of the unborn. Up until now, those faithful to God's word have witnessed one cultural defeat after the next, after the next, after the with acceleration. I found that a certain type that calls himself a liberal. I was I was a liberal. <laughs> I came up terribly surprised one time when I found that I was a right-wing conservative <laughs> extremist. But these, this so-called new liberal group, uh, Jesus, they never, they never listen to your point of view, and they make a decision as to what you think. And uh, they're articulate enough and in control of enough of the press to force that... Uh, uh, image out for the average person for some reason maybe it's these pictures they have not been able to do that with me checking the news and we may be seeing the end of Kathy Griffin you know a long time ago I stopped asking how low the left can go there doesn't seem to be any limit and Kathy Griffin, the low-class Democrat comic, has made a career out of being just as vile, filthy, and offensive as she possibly can. That's actually how I know she's a Democrat. And with this horrible stunt of her posing with the severed head of Donald Trump, should be the end of her career. I certainly hope so. If not, what's coming next? What will the left do next? I see uh, Senator Al Franken is supporting Griffin, even though he disagrees with the photo she posted. No surprise there. Franken is the Minnesota senator who is pushing legislation to mandate the homosexualizing of all kindergartners in America. What would you expect from a man with moral standards like that? Yes, my friends, we've got some more video footage of Hillary Clinton at that conference. What she just did there, what she said that Trump did with Russia, absolutely inconceivable. Wait till you hear it from her own mouth. Danny Gold, Liberty Writers News, first with some background. Hillary Clinton went to CodeCon to try to win over some new donors, and that's where she launched her conspiracy theory. Yes, now Hillary Clinton is one of the biggest 
conspiracy theorists in the nation. In the world, I'd say. He writes that she makes the aliens building pyramids look completely normal. Take a look. The question is where and how did the Russians get into this? And I think it's a very important question. So I, I assume that a lot of the people here may have, and if you haven't, I hope you will, read the declassified uh, report by the intelligence community that came out in early January. This is 17 agencies. 17 agencies, all in agreement, which I know from my experience as a senator and secretary of state is, is hard to get. They concluded with high confidence that the Russians ran an extensive information war campaign against my campaign to influence voters in the election. They did it through paid advertising, we think. They did it through uh, false news sites. They did it through these thousand agents. They did it through machine learning, which you know kept spewing out this stuff over and over again, the algorithms that they developed now. So that was the conclusion. And I think it's fair to ask, how did that actually influence the campaign? And how did they know what messages to deliver? Who told them? Who told them? Yeah. Who were they coordinating with or colluding with? Because the Russians historically, in the last couple of decades, and then increasingly, you know, are launching cyber attacks. And they are stealing vast amounts of information. And a lot of the information they've stolen, they've used for internal purposes, to affect markets, to affect um, the intelligence services, etc. So this was different, because they went public, and they were conveying this uh, weaponized information and the content of it. And they were running, you know, there's all these stories about, you know, guys over in Macedonia who are running these fake news sites. And, I, you know, I've seen them now. And you, you sit there and it looks like a, you know, sort of low-level CNN operation. And or a got, fake newspaper, or like a fake the Denver news, Guardian. Like a fake newspaper. And so the Russians, in my opinion, and based on the intel and counterintel people I've talked to, could not have known how best to weaponize that information unless they had been guided. And here's a here's guided by Americans. Guided by Americans and guided by people who had, you know, polling and data so who information. Is that? Now let me just finish because this is the second and third step. So we know that they they did that. We understand it. Um, best example. So within one hour, one hour of the Access Hollywood tapes being leaked. Within one hour, the Russians, let's say WikiLeaks, same thing, dumped <laughs> the John Podesta emails. Now, if you've ever read the John Podesta emails, they are anodyne to boredom. <laughs> but they... Yeah, we had him here once. Yeah, but they were... <laughs> they were... Yeah, and I, you know, forgive him for Wake what he up. said about you. Yeah. Um, so they were run-of-the-mill emails, especially run-of-the-mill for a campaign. Should we do this? What should she say? I don't, you know, the stuff that is so common, basic. Within one hour, they dumped them, and then they began to weaponize them. And they began to have some of their allies within the uh, Internet world, like Infowars, take out pieces and begin to say the most outrageous, outlandish, absurd lies you can imagine. And so they had to be ready for that, and they had to have a plan for that, and they had to be given the go-ahead. Okay, this could be the end of the Trump campaign. Dump it now, and then let's do everything we can to weaponize it. And we know it hurt us. You know what, Hillary? It's because you lost. Did you hear that, folks? She even blamed Infowars. Oh, you know Alex is going to have a field day with that one. My goodness, if there was ever a conspiracy theory, that woman just laid it out. She was really good at it. I mean, she really had all these innuendos and, and, and radical conclusions and connecting the dots. Believe me, I love conspiracies. I love trying to connect the dots and, and, and see the relationships between things. And that's exactly what she did. See, these, and these people did love to label everybody who disagrees with them or anyone who comes up like the Seth Rich thing. Oh, that's just a conspiracy theory, right? She laid it out, though. 
Clearly, clearly this woman has lost her marbles. And right here, the sad part is that every single interview that she does, she finds a new person to blame for the loss. So these are the people that Hillary Clinton has blamed for the loss so far. The FBI, James Comey, the then FBI director, the Russians, Vladimir Putin, anti-American forces, low information voters, everyone who assumed that she would win, bad polling numbers, Obama even for winning two terms, people wanting change, misogynists, suburban women, the New York Times, television executives, cable news, Netflix. She blamed Netflix for and Democrats for not making the right documentaries. Facebook, Twitter, WikiLeaks, fake news, and then content farms in Macedonia. You can't forget, of course, the Republican Party and also the, the Democrat Party, the DNC. She blamed them. But the saddest part about Hillary Clinton are the three names she left off the list of people to blame. John Podesta, Bill Clinton, and Hillary Clinton. So sad. So sad. Oh, boy. Hillary, when will you learn? I don't think you'll ever learn. We're at war with the most dangerous enemy that has ever faced mankind in his long climb from the swamp to the stars. And it's been said if we lose that war, and in so doing lose this way of freedom of ours, history will record with the greatest astonishment that those who had the most to lose did the least to prevent its happening. Well, I think it's time we ask ourselves if we still know the freedoms that were intended for us by the Founding Fathers. Not too long ago, two friends of mine were talking to a Cuban refugee, a businessman who had escaped from Castro. And in the midst of his story, one of my friends turned to the other and said, we don't know how lucky we are. And the Cuban stopped and said, how lucky you are. I had some place to escape to. And in that sentence, he told us the entire story. If we lose freedom here, there's no place to escape to. This is the last stand on earth. And this idea that government is beholden to the people, that it has no other source of power except the sovereign people, is still the newest and the most unique idea in all the long history of man's return, Americans showed their gratitude. In General Pershing's words, it didn't hurt America to have a general so bold that he was dangerous. Los Angeles went all out in its reception. With him was General Doolittle, whose eighth air force in Europe did so much to assure final victory. Although no unit, no individual won the war, we're fortunate in having won here tonight with us who had a large part in winning the war. I'm pleased and proud to have been privileged to fight by the side of General George Patton. Your Honor, Mayor. General Doolittle, soldiers, ladies and gentlemen, coming over here, there was a very great lesson. The first four hours, we passed over a destroyed land, utterly destroyed. You who have not seen it do not know what hell looks like from the top. That's what Germany looks like. That's what Austria looks like. That's what any place that the 8th Air Force and the 3rd Army worked on looks like. <laughs> you must remember this. That from Brest to various towns in southern Germany and Austria, whose names I can't pronounce, but whose, whose places I have removed. <laughs> the trail of the 3rd Army and the 19th Tactical Air Command and the 8th Air Force is marked by more than 40,000 white crosses. 
40,000 dead Americans. Few realized how deeply he felt about his men. Germany, with no more battles to win, Patton watched Americans compete on the playing field. Again, he saw the fighting spirit, the will to win, a quality he loved and admired, and which epitomized himself. Struggle was the test of a man. War, the supreme struggle, provided the highest test. He had expected his own death to be spectacular. In this one prediction, he was more mistaken than in the planning of any battle. He died of injuries received in an automobile accident four months after the end of the war. place of burial among the men of the third army who had fallen in the battle of the bulge his personality lives on in his statue at west point he lived for action and glory and reached the heights in serving his country patient man whether we believe in our capacity for self-government or whether we abandon the American Revolution and confess that a little intellectual elite in a far distant capital can plan our lives for us better than we can plan them ourselves. You and I are told increasingly we have to choose between a left or right. Well, I'd like to suggest there is no such thing as a left or right. There's only an up or down. Man's own old age dream, the ultimate in individual freedom consistent with law and order, or down to the ant heap of totalitarianism. And regardless of their sincerity, their humanitarian motives, those who would trade our freedom for security have embarked on this downward course. In this boat harvesting time, they use terms like the great society, or as we were told a few days ago by the president, we must accept a greater government activity in the affairs of the people. But they've been a little more explicit in the past, and among themselves, and all of the things I now will quote have appeared in print, these are not Republican accusations. For example, they have voices that say the Cold War will end through our acceptance of a not undemocratic socialism. Another voice says the profit motive has become outmoded. It must be replaced by the incentives of the welfare state. Or our traditional system of individual freedom is incapable of solving the complex problems of the conflict 20th Conflict in North Korea, John, would be probably uh, the worst uh, kind of fighting in most people's lifetimes. Why do I say this? Uh, the North Korean regime has hundreds of artillery cannons and rocket launchers within range of one of the most densely populated cities on Earth, which is the capital of South Korea. We are working with the international community to deal with this issue. This uh, regime is a threat to the region, to Japan, to South Korea, and in the event of war, they would bring danger to China and to Russia as well. But the bottom line is it would be a catastrophic war if this turns into uh, combat, if we're not able to resolve this situation through diplomatic means. North Korea has been testing missiles. Uh, are they getting any better at their capability? We always assume uh, that with a testing program, they get better with each test. You say North Korea is a threat to the region. Is North Korea a threat to the United States? It is a direct threat to the United States. They have been very clear in their rhetoric. Uh, we don't have to wait until they have an intercontin intercontinental ballistic missile with a nuclear weapon on it to say that now it's manifested completely. Senator Fulbright has said at Stanford University that the Constitution is outmoded. 
He referred to the president as our moral teacher and our leader. And he says he is hobbled in his task by the restrictions of power imposed on him by this antiquated document. He must be freed so that he can do for us what he knows is best. And Senator Clark of Pennsylvania, another articulate spokesman, defines liberalism as meeting the material needs of the masses through the full power of centralized government. Well, I for one resent it when a representative of the people refers to you and me, the free men and women of this country, as the masses. This is a term we haven't applied to ourselves in America. But beyond that, the full power of centralized government, this was the very thing the Founding Fathers sought to minimize. They knew that governments don't control things. A government can't control the economy without controlling people. And they know when a government sets out to do that, it must use force and coercion to achieve its purpose. Now for the dangers. One of the problems some believers fell into in supporting Donald Trump early on and throughout was at times to rationalize what was not of God, even sin or carnality, or to advocate for policies which are not necessarily biblical as if they were. There, there are, though there are issues that are issues. And those, the issue of his life and behavior, that, that does have a place. But most important will be his stands and his actions concerning America and the world. Those issues are still issues. And they should no, no more be defended or justified in a Donald Trump than in a Bill Clinton. We have to be, we cannot compromise in any direction. The Harbinger reveals the parallel, as I said, between the last days of Israel and, the, and these days of America. And the key scripture is Isaiah, as you may know, as most of you know, Isaiah 9:10, where the people, after, in, after having a warning sign from God in the form of an attack by really the first terrorists of the world, the Assyrians, they respond not with repentance, but defiance. And it centers on that vow that they make, that basically they say in Isaiah 9:10. We're coming back stronger. We're not going to repent. We're not going to. We're going to do it on our own. We're not going to be humbled. The Harbinger came out in 2012. First came out. I wrote it in 2010. 2010 years before this election. And what people, most people, don't realize is that in the pages of the Harbinger, I included Donald Trump. You can find it in the chapter entitled "The Tower." And here's a quote from it: "The fourth Harbinger is not simply about rebuilding, but what was destroyed." But it must specifically involve rebuilding bigger, taller, stronger, and better than before. That distinction is clear in the scripture and in the commentaries. And now from a commentary on Isaiah 9:10, Since their houses had been destroyed, they would build bigger, better, and finer ones. So too it came out in the words of those attempting to rebuild Ground Zero. One of the nation's most prominent real estate magnets said this of the proposed project. We should have the World Trade Center bigger and better from the commentators on ancient Israel, if they ruin our houses, we will repair them, speaking about ancient Israel, and make them stronger and finer than they were before, from the American magnate on the rebuilding of Ground Zero. What I want to see built is the World Trade Center stronger, maybe a story taller. Donald Trump was one of those words echoing Isaiah 9:10, the vow that brought judgment. And it was in the chapter of the tower. Donald Trump, more than any man alive, publicly, is linked to towers. And he was also linked in his life to pride and arrogance. And his campaign was, make America great again. Yes, but the only way America can be great again is for America to return to the God who made America great in the first place. <laughs> to vow to become great again without God, without a return to God, is Isaiah 9.10. It's the harbinger. To become great by our own powers without God. Now, he started out that campaign saying he didn't see any need for asking God for forgiveness. That is anti-biblical. At the same time, there has been a change, which I will get into. Another caution. One of his senior counsels is an activist for the gay agenda. And there are other issues. Nationalism and patriotism, for all fine. America first can also become an idol. The answer is not business. The answer is ec not economics. The answer is not America first. The answer is not self-interest or having no compassion on the stranger. The answer is only God. Only. But now on the other side, an interesting phenomenon has also taken place. More than any other group of people, people group or interest, it has been born-again evangelical believers who have influenced Donald Trump in this election. And who influenced this election. 
They were decisive this year. It appears that God has surrounded him with believers from Franklin Graham, James Robeson, Robert Jeffries, many others, and of course, Mike Pence, who is a strong and solid born-again believer, who said, quote, I am a Christian first, then a conservative, and then a Republican. And Mike Pence undoubtedly will be there to influence Donald Trump. Already he was put in charge of the transition. Then there are the cabinet appointments. It has been said there are more known born-again believers in this cabinet than of any other president. One of the men... Now, I'm not, saying, I'm not saying this was Donald Trump's plan, but I am saying that all this, God has his own plan. One of the main concerns of believers in recent times has been the indoctrination of children away from God. It's gotten a worse brazen, brazen, brazen. Where children as young as first graders, kindergartners, are being taught that sin is good and God's ways are wrong and you are not actually a male or a female, but you have to figure out who you, what you are. But Trump appointed a born-again believer who is a firm believer in homeschools and, and choice for parents and was reportedly given fortunes and donations to organizations like Focus on the Family as Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos. As America's ambassador for Israel, Trump picked David Friedman, a Jewish man who totally upholds the right of Israel to Israel and Jerusalem, and of whom it said he's more strong and conservative than Benjamin Netanyahu. <laughs> On the day that America under Obama abandoned Israel to the condemnation of the United Nations, which declared that Jerusalem didn't belong to Israel, Donald Trump answered it by telling Israel, hang on, Israel. Wait for November 20th. Trump has promised to move the American embassy for the first time from Tel Aviv to Israel's capital, Jerusalem. Now, there's much to say about that. That's in the other message, whether it's next week or after. But I will just say that the whole world is threatening that you do not do that. European unions, you can't do that. You know, the, the Palestinian Authority says you're going to have, we're going to, you're going to have it up. We're going to go, you can go crazy. You do that, all this stuff. Pray he has courage. Trump has also promised to defend believers' religious freedom, to seek to defend life, cut the funding for the killing of the unborn. Up until now, those faithful to God's word have witnessed one cultural defeat after the next, after the next, after the, with acceleration. They also knew those founding fathers that outside of its legitimate functions, government does nothing as well or as economically as the private sector of the economy. Now, we have no better example of this than government's involvement in the farm economy over the last 30 years. Since 1955, the cost of this program has nearly doubled. One-fourth of farming in America is responsible for 85% of the farm surplus. Three-fourths of farming is out on the free market and has known a 21% increase in the per capita consumption of all its produce. You see that one-fourth of farming, that's regulated and controlled by the federal government. In the last three years, we've spent $43 in the feed grain program for every dollar bushel of corn we don't grow. Okay, uh, let me start by saying that uh, for, for people that don't know a little bit about, about my history, I, I was not raised in church. I was, uh, I was a trained classical pianist through Trinity College of London. Um, I became a rock musician, got into drugs, and in 1974, uh, I found Christ in the streets. Um, and so that's where my journey started. And uh, so I've been ministering since, uh, since 1974. We did some street work. And, um, and so that's, that's where it all started. And, you know, I, uh, I think, you know, I'd like to use an example, if you don't mind, uh, the story of Mephibosheth, which every, a lot of people may not know this, this person, but um, he was uh, the, uh, the son, of, of course, of Prince Jonathan and the grandson of, of uh, King Saul. And uh, I'd like to share this because my journey is, uh, even though it's been very exciting and interesting, it also I got to a point where I started despising um, eschatology and, and even to the point where I started mocking it because uh, I, I'd seen too much uh, prediction. I've seen a lot of predictions that were... Um, it caused a lot of fear and, and torment and trouble in people's lives. And so I had to make a change, and I had to do that. And this only happened a few years ago and uh, <clears throat> because of, of, of certain things that happened. But, but I want to say something uh, to your audience as well. 
uh, about making mistakes, about uh, being incorrect, uh, is that it is possible. Um, the Bible says in Second Samuel 9 that Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, uh, for, but he ate, he ate continually at uh, the king's table and was lame on both his feet. And in thinking about that, I was thinking that, you know, Mephibosheth was no great ornament uh, to a royal table. Yet he, he had a, a continual place at David's table because I think it was because David could see in his face the features of the beloved Jonathan that he loved so much. And, you know, I think that God's people are dear because of someone else's sake. Uh, David saw Jonathan in Mephibosheth and, uh, and because of Christ, God sees Christ in us. And so, um, you know, he had a deformity that we know about. He was lame. Uh, and, he, he, you know, that was a great deformity because it happened when he was a kid. But our deformity cannot drop us of our privileges. Lameness, lameness, lameness is no bar to sonship. Uh, the cripple uh, is as much the heir as if he could run uh, uh, swiftly. And, and this is the point I'm trying to make here, is that sometimes bad nursing in spiritual infancy often causes wrong ideas, misconception, and many times error, from which they never recover. And I'd like to say that there was a flaw in my life. I had good parts. You know, uh, Mephibosheth had good parts. His hands worked, his heart worked, his mouth worked, but his feet didn't work. And so for people that are quick to judge because of they saw that fault where I was opposed to the rapture, I was opposed to um, any form of eschatology because that, that um, I still sat at his table and I still loved him and he still loved me. And uh, because of my love to God, he turned what could have been a curse into a blessing uh, because of what happened. So that, I wanted to say that to start, uh, that my love for God is so deep that I had to take steps to correct uh, what I realized was blatant disregard and disdain for a large portion of eschatology because I felt that there were, these were doctrines of death and the aftermath. And so I treated it as an area of theology that I wanted to avoid. And, uh, you know, I, tr I, I mean, there were so many other areas that I could study. I could study uh, theology, uh, Christology, pneumatology, uh, bibliology, angelology, all, all that. And, uh, and stay away from eschatology. Uh, and so that's what happened in my life. I, but it got to the point where I was so discouraged because I felt that there was a, a, a mentality of escapism where we should really be on the earth blessing and helping that I actually wrote on my website in 1996, Rapture Crapture. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> because I was so, you know, and, and, and people, of course, people, uh, you know, they, they just, we just ignored it. I mean, I, I even stood up one day and said, I have no clue what the book of Revelation is back. I don't have one clue and I don't really want to know. Um, the other thing that happened was that that attitude put me in opposition against Israel as a nation. Now, that sounds very strange, I know, because I'm so supportive of Israel. Uh, but I, 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 did, I, I felt like Israel was just a, a waste and then that there was, we were spiritual Israel. And this is where, you know, in my own encouragement or exhortation and, and even prophetic utterances, my perception uh, of Israel was it's totally spiritual Israel. There is no such thing as God's land anymore. And so my prophecies would even, uh, the, the, the vocabulary that I'd use would be my spiritual Israel. And so the error came because of my ignoring and ignorance of eschatology and end time events. So, so I want your viewers to understand that it affected uh, my outlook on the end time. So, you know, I was just, that's where, anyway, so I got to that point where I even wrote songs, uh, you know, uh, about, um, you know, uh, I'm not afraid of the lion's den, I'm not afraid of the fire, I'm not afraid of the 666, and I'm not afraid of the beast. And we'd all sing it together and sort of, um, you know, almost mock, uh, you know, because we had seen so much uh, prediction that he's coming soon, he's coming soon, that it, it, it really hurt me in the end. And then something beautiful happened. Um, I started... Uh, I went to Israel to do a concert. I hope I'm not speaking too much. You can interrupt me any time. No, no, no. Carry on, carry on. Carry on. We're going to hear. Okay. <laughs> so, um, in 2008, this is, a, this is how far it went. Um, I went to Israel and had a concert on Mount Carmel. As you know, I'm a musician. 
and um, and and so I have a band, and we do. Uh, and I, when I stood on Mount Carmel, it was almost like God put me in a position because I was there to do music. But I thought, what am I going to what am I going to say about Israel? Because I don't believe, you know, in in, in literal Israel. I, I'm a I, I was a, um, a replacement theologist, really. And so when I was on Mount Carmel, eighteen hundred people, millions of people watching, I the Spirit of the Lord came upon me and I started speaking about God's hand upon Israel, the land. And, and I, I was confused because uh, it, it just it wasn't making sense to me. You can understand I, I'm trying to teach the people that the kingdom is here and it's now and everything pertains to now. Um, and that's when the Spirit of the Lord began to deal with me and uh, Jane uh, was with me at the time and she said, uh, you know, we should start an internet broadcast, uh, you know, because we have a good following. Um, and I said, what am I going to do? She said, well, you sit behind a, a, a camera and, you, and, you, and you, you preach, you teach. And I said, I could never do that. But anyway, she, she heard the voice of God as she'd done so many times during my life. And uh, we came back to uh, Los Angeles and set up a little room and we put a camera there and I put a piano in front of me. And I started teaching and, and, and our internet bro broke down. We had such a large audience, hundreds of thousands of people watching. And... The, what happened was, I started learning about Israel. That's where it all started. And then very reluctantly, I was placed in the position, it was God, obviously, where I, it was suggested to me, why don't you start an online church? I said, don't be crazy. Can you imagine me? I'm not a pastor. I'm a prophetic voice. You know, my music is, I'm a psalmist. And, um, and they said, no, I think, you, you know, that, and the Spirit of the Lord was obviously dealing with me about it, but I could never imagine myself being a, 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 you know, a pastor. I don't even like to say the word. And, um, you know, I, I would say to them, listen, I'll just fill the ship and we'll go out to sea and then I'll sink it. I said, there's no way I'm going to be a pastor. But the, the thing is, we started an online church and I thought we'll have, you know, 100 people. And um, we, we ended up we're having tens of thousands of people join our online church. But, you know, offering it to them, obviously we encourage people to go to their local church too, but... And we ended up with 24,000 people, members of our online church. And it dawned on me, how can I not teach them um, eschatology? How can I not teach them about the end times? How can I, not, how can I keep this from these people? And my wife started, um, because of what was going on, started uh, listening. And this is what I prayed. This is what I prayed. I said, Lord, if you're going to, to correct me, if you're going to put me straight... Uh, and teach me, then I want you to send me the very, very best. Almost like Cornelius, uh, when, 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 he, when the angel came to him and sent him the very best, he sent him Simon Peter, and uh, to bring that conversion about. And so, um, so I, that was my prayer. And Jane had been listening to various uh, speakers, they were really great. And I started getting interested and in saying, you know, this, this is starting to make sense about the rapture and about the, you know, all the different things that, that you teach. And um, so I sat there and listened, and I, I didn't like one of the teachers. They seemed very legalistic. And then I walked through the bedroom one day, and I heard this voice. And it was the voice of Chuck Missler. And I stopped, and I listened, and I listened, and I said, My goodness, this is, this is everything's coming alive, and it's making sense, this whole thing. Um, and so I sat there and listened with her over and over. And uh, then the Lord spoke to me and said, This is the best that I've got for you. And if you're going to learn, I'm going to send him uh, to you. And so that's, in a nutshell, what, what happened. And, of course, Chuck, you came. You not only taught us, and we're learning, of course, you know, through chaos, but we, we actually, there was an impartation brought by your presence. And, uh, you know, I'm not trying to make too much of you. You are a general in the kingdom. But there's something about being in the presence of somebody. Uh, and when that person releases uh, you from, you know, the, the de I don't want to say demons, but, you know, the things that I had, I, I, I almost had a, a spirit of mockery uh, towards it, that, um, of course, I've, I've changed my mind about that now, and, and, uh, and as a result of it, it's, it's, it's opened up a whole new avenue of, of truth and understanding. Well, there's another element to all this whole story that I think I, I need to add here. What was so incredibly impacting to us was your candor and your transparency to your audience. 
it wasn't something that you were privately mentioning to us as a, a, a desire and interest. You so openly, before your people, admitted the need for some correction. And I, I, that's the kind of candor and transparency, candidly, bluntly, to say it very directly, is so rare in the Christian community. So many senior pastors are really very in, in very insecure seats, if you will. You were such a refreshing change because you were just so direct about the things that you felt were an error and so aggressive or directed uh, to, per, to correct that. I was just startled. And, uh, and as we came out and got to know you and your people and spend time with you, I, I, uh, I come away from that experience with a comfort and a confidence in you personally that I have had with very few people. I spent 30 years in the corporate boardrooms in my executive career. I got to know a lot of top-notch people. When I shifted to what I'll call professional Christianity, it was a real adjustment because it was the, 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 the caliber of people you're dealing with is so different in terms of their personal, personal ethics. And I was just so startled how refreshing your attitude was about your ministry and, 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 and your people. You were really seriously felt responsible to be faithful to them in a, such an open way uh, that is something that's hard to communicate. You know, if we talk to strangers, it's hard to get that. What may these sounds? The highs and the lows. May these sounds who have had an infiltration of God's Spirit bring the peace Father our hearts have been plowed by Judah, by praise. Every heart that was bitter and hardened before they came on has now been broken. Fellow ground, ready for the seed, for the word. We stand before you, a nation that has been mourning knowing that there is a plan up until May the 1st to destroy us to hurt us but we have prayed and today we as a people are going to do something that King David did to break the progress of this cursed attack. You instructed me to do it. And now with our hearts broken by the plow of the heavenly sower, as they are open, cast your truth into us. For today, we shall yield you a bountiful harvest. It is still the month of April. April is the opening. Barrenness destroyed. And Lord, we approach you now to break the curse in our lives and our homes, families and our nation. Whether we're in Australia, England, Middle East, Asia, we know you are doing something special and we give ourselves to you. Amen. So I decided to let my dad explain that a little better because he, nobody could say it like my dad. but. 
you know, that, that time of praise, just like he was saying, is, 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 is plowing. You're plowing the heart to be ready for the seed, for the word to be implanted into you. And so that's why it all begins with praise. And that's why today, I just, today's, I'm so glad today's worship was just, just unbelievably good because it just aligns straight up with what I wanted to talk about. Um, and so, you know what I did? I thought, okay, well, let me just look up stuff about Judah and the tribe of Judah. Um, because of this Judah shall plow van and how it kept coming up. And um, the word Jew actually comes from Judah, which I didn't know. Um, uh, you know, many of the, of the other tribes, there were 12 tribes, were scattered or rejected by God. But the Levites, the Benjamites, and the Judites were collectively called the Jews. And those were the ones left to praise God. And, um, you know, I think about the House of Destiny. And I think about my dad and the warriors of the new millennium. And he specifically focused on wounded warriors, people who had been hurt by the church or, or, or things in their life or whatever it may be. You're a wounded warrior, a fighter. And um, um, that's who we are here. We're those people who don't fit the mold. You know, you, you maybe don't feel comfortable in your local church. Nothing against the local church, but maybe you don't feel comfortable there or you don't feel like you fit in, this is a place that you can fit in. And this is a tribe. Um, and it's very much like the tribe of Judah. We praise, we prophesy, uh, we're warriors, we're fighters. And um, in the face of adversity, we are rejoicing. You know, it doesn't matter what those situations are. Well, what's, like Sunil said, what's on the news? Oh, it's too much. So what, we're, what are we going to do? We're going to combat that and rejoice and praise. And so I, I was interested in Jacob, you know, because Jacob wrestled with God and God called him Israel. And then Jacob had the son Judah. And in Genesis 49 verse 10, Judah, I mean, Jacob prophesies over Judah. And he says, Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Remember that. Your sons will bow down to you. You are a lion's cub, O Judah. You return from the prey, my son. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down. Like a lioness, who, who dares to rouse him? The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff, from between his feet, until Shiloh come. To whom it belongs and the obedience of the nations is his. He will tether his donkey to a vine, his colt to the choicest branch. He will wash his garments in wine, his robes in the blood of grapes. His eyes will be darker than wine, his teeth whiter than milk. Now there's so much in that prophecy, but I'm just going to touch on a few things today. Uh, the thing that interested me a lot was your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. And this made me think about my dad. Um, you know, because... Judah's hands um, and, and people who are like that tribe of Judah, you get a hold of, hold of the neck of your enemy. And that is not a vindictive thing. That is the will. And, um, you, and this is what my father was doing. And when I was reading about this, it, it ju I just could see my dad in all of this. And, and, and we are an extension of that, the spirit of that. And um, you locate... And take hold of the will of your enemy and change that will into the will of God. And my father did that using his hands. So your hand will be on the neck of your enemy. And, um, um, you know, that, that just, uh, it just made me think of dad. And then uh, the scepter will not depart from Judah nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until Shiloh comes. Shiloh is Jesus. And... Jacob was actually seeing the Messiah coming through the line of Judah, his son Judah, because Jesus was the lion of the tribe of Judah. And Jesus said in, in John 15, verse 1, I am the true vine. Remember that about he will tether his donkey to a vine? He's called to the branch, will wash his garments in wine. Jesus said, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. John 15, verse 1. And there's the garden again. And it all just connected to me because I just, I kept seeing my dad when reading about this tribe of Judah. And I kept thinking of all of you and us here. And um, 
you know, even the team, um, as, as I was watching today, I, I just, God spoke to my spirit and I realized something. It's that, you know, many, over the years, my dad was in ministry for many years and many people came and went. But there were certain people that God chose and my dad recognized them and had them join him. And God chose each and every one of you, all of you on the team. They're not on the stage anymore, but they're out there. <laughs> um, God chose you to stand with the prophet in this time for a reason. You were each chosen by God to join us in this unusual, you know, not fitting the mold place and this tribe of warriors, of, of wild, you know, you think about my dad, he was, he was wild and chaotic and unpredictable and his hair and his, everything about him was, it didn't fit a mold. And, you know, the poor thing he tried in the beginning when he first became a Christian to put on the suit and cut his hair and it didn't work because he was meant to be that. And if you look through in the Bible, God used the most unexpected people imperfect people to to fulfill his plan and his will um, Moses stuttered Jeremiah said oh, I'm a youth I, I can't speak I, uh, you know you think if you go through the Bible it's just it's a reoccurring theme John the Baptist was out there eating locusts I mean that was a wild man but he recognized the Messiah he recognized the Messiah he was the one who said ah there he is and so God created those kinds of people because they're necessary we're necessary so if you're a part of the house of destiny you're a part of that tribe that's in the spirit of judah so if you don't fit in anywhere else maybe you do fit in other places and you can be here too but this is a place for you and um you know today i wanted to uh let my dad close out the broadcast because I found something so phenomenal and beautiful that he did. And, um, you know, before, before I play it, there's a few things I want you to pay attention to. First of all, um, the clip that you just saw and this next one we're going to play for you are both from April 20th of 2013. And he was think, uh, seeing things and talking about things that were going on right then, but he was also seeing the future and what's going on right now. And when you see this, you're going to, you're going to get it. You're, you're going to understand why I wanted you to, to see it. Because it all ties in with that spirit of pythos. Because in that, remember he was talking about, he was in the month of April going into the month of May. That that was when it would begin. That was the beginning of the end for that spirit of pythos. And we are now seeing that that thing dying and it's thrashing around all over our TVs and all over our news channels. It's thrashing around as it dies. And that's what he saw. And um, he was actually taking the offering. Uh, so, um, you know, listen to what he has to say about giving too and, and the importance of that too. And, you know, if you haven't, if you haven't taken an opportunity today or felt led today, uh, listen to him now because he, he, you, might, you might be able to see what the importance of sowing into what's going on spiritually. Because that's what we're here to recognize. You know, we know what's going on naturally in the world and what seems like chaos, like fire, is, is there's hope. There's gold, gold in the fire. And uh, so I just want to thank you for joining us today. We love you all, all over the world. I know you're watching. And even though I can't see you out there, I know you're there. And we love you. And we thank you so much for your support. And um, I just want to go ahead and play the next clip and let my dad take us out today. And, and let's rejoice with him, too. Thank you. The worship was magnificent. He settled in in your homes and your lives. Suddenly, there was just that moment of peace. Maybe some of you had a, 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 an appearance or a visitation. There was a presence. What is this to give to Him from our hands? And I spoke it out, the curse that would come. And that which would happen between the 70th and the 100th day, 
since the inauguration of President Obama and the re-election of Netanyahu. It is now. Over the Passover it started. And we're almost at the 100th day, which is May the 1st. The vision I had was between that period of time, the spirit of Pythos would begin to die in this country. What is Pythos? It is strangulation, suffocation, enough now please, of us prophesying more doom to this country. I see the light. You see what's on here? This is not real gold, but it's <coughs> something the Lord said to me this morning. He said, I want you to take this jacket. It represents gold. And you hear me out, please. Come, what are you saying? What's the gold? So I, I don't know what you're saying. Keep your eyes open. It is a sign. Not only naturally, materially, if you wish, but also spiritually. Many of you are saying, I, I, I believe this principle that you're speaking. I'm going to do it today. He said, Kim, I want to bless this nation. As much as there are people out there saying, I wish it would just crumble because we don't like President Obama. Stop it! This nation was raised up under God's hand for the prosperity of the earth so that they would give and help. God wants to put gold into your hands. This is not a prosperity message. This is the Bible. Are you with me? Now I'm, I'm asking God to watch you as you come and you, you place your offering on the altar through the red link. If you don't like the red link, then get a, a, a piece of paper and an envelope and mail it in. There's always a way to give people. But do it right now because the plague is stopping the curse is being broken. The python, which is a demonic force of divination, is being destroyed. And so I think it's appropriate before we pray. There's gold in the fire. There's gold in the fire. There's gold in the fire. And it's me. Remember something, gold was purified by fire, fire again upon the nation, purification and gold, which speaks of faith. I see an America filled with faith again. Do you see it? There's gold in the fire, there's gold in the fire. There's gold in the fire, and it's me. There's gold in the fire. There's gold in the fire. There's gold in the fire, and it's me. Now I can see a poor man standing in the fire. Yeah. A poor man standing in the fire. Can you see it? Can you see it? I can see a poor man standing in the fire. Who is he? Jesus is a poor man standing in the fire. I see faith. I see smiles. I see prosperity. If you would receive that today, as you give, I believe the curse is being broken. Now take these beautiful people that have come before you to give and stand next to them. 
and God bless America and God bless his people Amen Woo!